This is Kevin for Crackberry.com. Hey, it's Phil from Android Central. Derek from PreCentral. And this is Renee from Tippy.com. And welcome to Mobile Nations, our bi weekly podcast focusing on everything inter industry, cross site, and general mobility related. Kevin, they're asking the chat room already what is this Mobile Nations thing we're doing today? What is Mobile Nations? Okay, so it is our unifying brand that basically, well, think of us as the the United Nations of the mobile space, right? Individually, we have our awesome sites. We have Crackberry, we have Android Central, we have Tippy, we have PreCentral, we have Windows Phone, WP Central, uh, and they're all awesome communities, and they're all huge, right? They're all literally nations. Uh, so one day in the shower, you know, <laughs> boom, we had the idea to unite them all together under the Mobile Nations brand, and it, and it makes a lot of sense because we've seen over the years people switch platforms. So if you're going to make the switch one day from, you know, Apple to BlackBerry, <laughs> <laughs> why wouldn't you, uh, you know, stay within the family here? And, and Mobile Nations uh, makes it that much easier to do that. And you know, over the weeks ahead, you'll see some really exciting stuff that makes that message more clear. So you're not asking about it anymore, which is awesome. We're super excited. Well, now, is that a subtle or not so subtle uh, dig at Apple's Let's Talk iPhone event yesterday, which seems, I mean, it seems by all consideration, the analysts and the fanboys were expecting Apple to release a solid stainless steel Galaxy S2 running iOS with BBM and card stacks. And anything less than that was an utter fail. Yep. So that I was not trying to be subtle at all. I was trying to stick it in and twist, basically. <laughs> it's like the knife in me. Well, Apple came out. It was the new CEO. It was Tim Cook, not Steve Jobs, right at the outset. They spent about an hour rehashing everything that everyone in the media had already heard at WWDC. And then they showed the iPhone 4S, which is identical to the Verizon iPhone 4, but it has new internals. It has a dual-core processor, twice as fast seven times as fast graphics, has an eight megapixel camera with five mirror glass, pieces of glass in it. I'm not a technical here. 2.4, you know, F-stop 2.4. And they did a Siri demo, which is that company they bought that's kind of like artificially intelligent voice control. And that was about it. And either people were happy because they had, you know, reasonable expectations or they wanted to kill Apple just to watch them die. Siri, what is the iPhone 4S? <laughs> it is what is going to make Apple lots of money next year. Hey, you didn't mention that we did like a, well, I only did two hours. I think you did a three-hour <laughs> we have, podcast. We have a two-hour podcast up on iTunes now that it was uh, myself, Georgia, Seth Clifford, uh, Phil Nickinson, and Kevin Mitchell covering the event live, which was hilarious. I listened to it again when I was editing it. Well, covering it live from... Four well, points of the continent. We, we, we weren't covering the event. We were providing color, commentary, and frivolity surrounding the event. And then an hour and a half podcast to wrap it all up and try to make sense of it. So I talked a lot. I also had a sandwich. <laughs> so let's go around the room and just see what you think. I mean, is, was this, is this going to make, is Apple appearing on Sprint going to make it harder for BlackBerry and Android? Or did Apple drop the ball and give maybe Kevin BlackBerry a chance to, to reclaim some territory? I would like to say Apple dropped the ball a bit. And, you know, we ran a poll on, on Crackberry yesterday asking our audience that much. And it was pretty much, you know, 95% in favor of that being the case where, you know, uh, I think 40% said, you know, Apple totally dropped a big time on this one. Everybody else kind of said, well, it's a better iPhone, but nothing really that exciting. And it's funny, you know, I think internally, the internal specs, it's all a good bump up. I mean, watching your podcast yesterday, I think Phil said it best when, but what did you say, Phil? Apple caught up to where Android was six months ago? I mean, in a lot of the specs, but no, I mean, the comparisons are still wrong, I think. And I wouldn't say Apple dropped the ball. Only thing in I oh, just Phil, it's the I visuals. Know. It's the visuals, though. You can't Start. release a, one phone. And what was, how long has it been? 14 months? Has it been that long? Yeah, uh, 16. Renee, 16, 16 months. 16 months and make it look identical. And it's going to be another year? So two and a half years? I mean, most people don't want to look at anything for that long. Never, <laughs> never mind something. They don't want to look at their they, wives for that long. Exactly. So I'm like, that's dropping the ball. Even if they put a metal back on, just something different, thin it out, like those first leaks, you know, do something to visually make it look different everything else is saying there would have been a winner yesterday Kevin but the fact that ch channeling georgia is making my head hurt yeah, yeah. So, is that, so is that what she does too yeah, yeah she yells at me just the same way 
So it's all true. it would have taken to satisfy these people is a the iPhone 4 in a different case. Or with the name iPhone 5. That would have been Yeah, but honestly, if they would have done the name difference and a slightly different, like, force people to buy some new accessories because we don't want to see the same, you know, Angry Birds covers on, on iPhones and that. And uh, people would have been happy. But instead, fail. So what about this? <laughs> what if Apple had not done an event at all? If they just announced it, like, hey, here it is. Drop would that have been fine? If, if they had not announced an event and then gotten everybody all riled up like they always do, would we mm-hmm. have, be having this conversation right now? But, but was it was it Apple who riled people up or was it certain you know sites who started putting up these crazy rumors about no, yeah, no, ginormous it, iPhone well, it, updates? It's both, right? One feeds the other. Uh, Chris Davies from Slashgear, I thought, did a really good post on Google Plus this morning about uh, just the relationship of all these sites and how sites started writing for other sites and not for their readers. Um, and to watch just the hate that came out yesterday when people started saying, oh, this site said this and it was wrong. And I, I think one site, you know, I don't mean to start calling names and I, and I really don't want to, but it, it's like one site that's more traditional journalism is trying to be like the cool hip, you know, rumor mongering site now. And the rumor mongering sites are trying to be the traditional journalists and it, it's just such a mess. Nobody knew what the hell they were the talking about. The fringe universe. Yeah. <laughs> this is where I like just being able to write rumors and stuff about devices that are never going to be released. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's my question for, for you, Derek, because I think Tippy, like I, I'm going to take a moment in the spotlight here and say Tippy did an awesome job. I think we nailed the iPhone 4S oh, yeah. quite a while ago. You know, 9 to 5 Mac did an awesome job too. The next web got it a couple days before as well. But and, and we did two articles, one on setting expectations and one on, you know, Mulder versus Scully, and we tried our darndest not to get people to envision that iPhone 5 that the case makers were, were pushing so hard. But, you know, you've had that for a long time, Derek. People like this, Palm building up this massive expectational debt, and then your community, like, looking at you the next day. Uh, yeah, but, you know, we've never had all these, the, the massive rumors came out. You know, when we, then, uh, what was it, the Think Big, Think Small, and Think Beyond, uh, where they announced the touchpad the VR in the pre three, there were no expectations. They knew we were going to do a touchpad and that it was going to be somewhat iPad like. Nobody had real massive expectations about it. Our expectations have always been about the user experience and that, you know, the hardware for whatever reason was never really quite able to back that up. Uh, so people stopped expecting to be blown away a long time ago in WebOS land. The thing that interests me, Phil, and I, if I want to be consistent, I gave Google a hard time with the Nexus S because I said the Nexus One was a forward-thinking Android device. It was the Android device of the future. And Nexus mm. S was a summation. It was the culmination of the last year of Android devices. And that's kind of like what iPhone 4S feels to me. It feels to me like it's the same case, but it's kind of like it's Apple sum, summing up what, what phones have become in the last year. And they're not, I know Jerry did an editorial on this, they're not projecting what phones are going to be in the next year. Yeah, um, I think the big difference is Google switched manufacturers, and you didn't, you know, you obviously don't get that with Apple. Uh, so you're really going to be comparing just two totally different devices. Um, you know, in that said, I didn't like the Nexus S. I like the I like the Nexus S more now than I did a year ago. Um, well, it hadn't even been out a year. <laughs> um, I still love the Nexus One, but they're two very different devices made by different manufacturers with very different design philosophies, and while I'm not sure if Samsung had more pull in the design of the Nexus S than HTC did the Nexus One. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all. So, Kev, I mean, you have this giant Cunix Superphone on the future. Are, are, is if Apple had put out, you know, that that big flat iPhone Five, I think people would have rushed to get it. But now maybe they're going to hold off and wait for the the Nexus Prime or the Cunix Superphone, or or maybe the next iPhone. I mean, one of the uh you know, things I found interesting is even for myself, right? I've, I buy all the iPhones when they come out. I, it's one of those things I have to do. But uh, following yesterday's announcement, I won't be in a rush. And, you know, I have a couple of friends where I live here who are, I don't know how I'm friends with them, but they're iPhone users. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were planning to go on, on launch day to wait in line. And then after yesterday's announcement, uh, you know, they hit me up. And they're like, yeah, I'm not going to get it anymore. And, you know, looking at one of the polls that you ran on Tippy, I mean, I was shocked because this is an iPhone iOS fan site where 90% of people, I would think, or more should be 
ready to throw cash at Apple. at the bit. And what was what were the stats on that? Uh, about sixty percent of people are saying that they're not going to get. And that could change on order day, but right now, at the day after, when they woke up in the morning, turned over and looked at who was next to them, they said no, thank you. Sixty percent. Yeah. So I mean, to me, it's that. I don't know how else. I mean, those results speak for themselves, right? I think our opinions almost don't matter on it. It's like, look, if people were going to upgrade and now they're not. That means Apple did not do a good enough job because people think they can just wait it out another year and then upgrade to whatever. And it might not be switching to BlackBerry or, or Android. It's just maybe they'll wait for the next iPhone now. This wasn't a big enough leap. The thing that's interesting, Derek, is that Apple's made a big deal mm-hmm. about how software, you know, they, they're a software company. They only make hardware so they can make the software they want. And they kind of bet big this year because their only real new exciting demo was Siri. That kind yeah. of a new UI, a new input method. Do you think that is enough to convince anybody? I, well, considering that it won't be coming to the iPhone 4, it may be. Uh, I think if they had included text input as well, it might be a bit more enticing. Because I personally, yeah, I never like talk, I don't even like voice dial. I don't like talking to my phone. And I think I'll be a little even even more uh, apprehensive about it when my phone starts talking back to me. Especially if it really we talked about this yesterday. to talk back. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we, we talked not, about this yesterday. It's, this is something we've had on Android forever, and I still don't use I mean, I use it sparingly, maybe in the car. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a very impressive tech demo, but I'm not sure that, you know, I, I think that really the big thing for iOS 5 is going to be the iCloud and all that everything is synced in the cloud. Siri, uh, while it's impressive, uh, it's not going to be something really going to catch on. So I guess my last question before we move on is, Kevin, you know, Apple shows off iOS 5 usually three, four months before the new phone. Does that take some of the wind out of the big announcement? Because we've all been using iOS 5 for three or four months now. So, you know, it was really impressive at the time, but now been there, done that, and the new phone doesn't get the push from the new software announcement. Yeah, agreed. It, and it also seems weird that, you you know, your numbers don't line up anymore, right? You have a 4S, but you have 5 software all of a sudden. Is yeah. that... That's there was you know, iOS like, two on. The how did iPhone Apple's iPhone marketing? Two. Yeah, but how did Apple's marketing department allow that to happen? I Every don't understand. Every time Steve Jobs goes away, Phil Schiller puts that letter S in a box and slams it next to the name. It's not even a nice looking a S, though. It's ah, oh, I don't know. It's a horrible. I saw Derek complaining about it immediately. <sighs> but it's definitely it loses some excitement for sure, though. I mean, that, at least that's my take on it. You can, I, I think part of the problem is that they spent an hour and ten minutes just going over rehashing the announcement that took an hour and 30 minutes six months ago yeah renee show your the logo on your shirt you know to the camera to our viewers there's a little apple and now beat your chest and that was yesterday it's like we are apple we are great that's what they they did well i mean it it was even crazier because we put up our review of the uh, 2011 ipod touch yesterday (laughs) and (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> best review ever they saved me a ton of time because all i had to write is it comes in white now <laughs> okay yes that i can understand not really updating the nano because it's a nano and they got a software update to make it more usable but seriously nothing new for the ipod touch nothing no new chip <laughs> no no siri no a5 no better screen nothing it's last it. Apple's iPod done. Right. They're they're dead no, I think they're building cars or something, and they're just they're, <laughs> everybody's working. All the smart people are now on a different team building some totally different genre of product. They got they're like we got phones, we got tablets, we got the iPod stuff. What's next? And now the they're iPad just in- three better. The iPad two yeah. S better blow my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Kev, do you think that it was more like did should Tim Cook have have had a better event for his first event as CEO? Was that part of the disappointment? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, I think that was one of the things that immediately made some of us sad, right? Is we're we're sad that Steve Jobs isn't there. I mean, I like Steve Jobs, right? I was sad he wasn't there, uh, which kind of made me want Tim Cook to do a good job, though, and follow up. It'd be a sad story, right, if it went from you know having the most recognizable CEO to having somebody who's who who can't live up to it. And yeah, I wish he would have had something more exciting to announce yesterday because it definitely puts a bit of a sour note not sour note but it's a letdown a bit All right, so meanwhile yep. well uh, sorry. Hey, hey, hang on back up what's the definition of a successful event here i mean they got the press to come out they got the hype they announced the hardware i mean what what is your definition of a successful event and i haven't watched it yet 
So I'll say that flat out. But, I mean, is your expectation set too high? No, but it's what gets written. At, it's what get, gets announced and how it's received by everybody, consumers and yeah, immediate. I, I, I'm willing does to anybody, bet what, really what was written has nothing at, to do with how the event went, right? It has to do with specs. Well, right, but I'm, that's what I'm saying. They, they shouldn't have... His first, first event, to be a success, he needs to announce something that is pure awesome and makes him look like a Steve Jobs follow-up god. Uh, and instead, well, he's been in charge for, what, a month? Officially? Yeah. All right, that's... You know, the, the iPhone 4S was done probably two months ago. Yeah, it was finalized around WWDC time. Is Tim Cook... They, is he on the he Twitter? Was device. The problem, <laughs> I think, with the event was probably the delivery. But in two months, that's going to mean jack squat because they're going to sell 20 million of them. Yeah. yeah. True. I think but that's the thing. It was like it was the, the whole – like usually there's a, there's a very interesting way they put these together. Like Steve comes out. He hands things off. He comes back. He does his one more thing shtick. It's very orchestrated. It's very – it's almost like a stage act. It's stagecraft. Mm -hmm. And this time it seemed almost like the Michael Bay version of – of a of an Apple event where things just happen for no reason in different parts and there's no real narrative and there's no coming back together it just it seemed kind of bloated and un, unscripted I think Aaron Sorkin like, done a pass like any other press event yeah we we did we did well no 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 because I've sat through a lot in the past year and, and <laughs> Samsung's Samsung's for better or for worse are pretty heavily scripted. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't really sat through a Motorola one. Google's Google's are actually pretty well done. They just end up having you know technical issues when you have five thousand people in one room. And where's ladies man? Happen. Where's ladies? Yeah, man? you know, and, and we've seen that happen to Apple too. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we cannot, cannot, cannot judge this release by the delivery. I think that's just ridiculous. Yeah. Judge it by the thing you're holding in your hand, or by blogger expectations and next day regrets. Yeah. Yeah. So while we were busy doing that, Phil, you were showing... Hey, hang on. I, I want to talk about one more thing about the iPhone, and that's Sprint. Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, well, I mean, I want to make you be... talk about it. But... <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's you? You're handing that over to Derek? I don't care. Sure. Uh, Sprint <laughs> on the iPhone is going to be the end of the original WebOS user base. Ooh. Because these people have been hanging around for two plus years waiting for a phone... Yeah, they're not going to get a WebOS phone on Sprint. Okay, yeah. these 25 Italian restaurants are in North Beach. Well, keep going, I'm just putting it here. Sorry, is that Surrey? Okay. Siri is telling us what's going to happen with, with the iPhone on Sprint and WebOS, <laughs> yeah. Um, you, the, it, it's going to just decimate what's left of the Sprint WebOS population, which isn't much anymore. Those that haven't moved on to Android, they've been waiting for something else, and the iPhone is going to be as good as they're going to get if they don't want to do Android. No offense to Windows Phone 7. Who? <laughs> is, is that a problem for BlackBerry 2 on Sprint, Kevin? Or do you think there are two very different user bases there? Uh, it's pretty different. I mean, I think a lot of the people who are on Sprint on BlackBerry want physical keyboards. I mean, sure, you're going to lose some to uh, iPhone when it go, goes there. But I think there's a, a core audience that RIM will continue to cater to there. So it might hurt it a little, but but it won't kill it. And, you know, the 9930 has been doing really well for Sprint, and I, I think that'll continue, right? There's a, a messaging base there. And the other interesting thing we didn't mention is the, the iPhone 4 is dropping to 99 bucks on AT&T, Sprint, and Verizon. And on AT&T, they're going to have an iPhone 3GS for free. Gizmodo totally called it. Do not buy that phone. Do, or <laughs> do, not, buy that, do not buy that free phone. Just ignore it. Pretend it doesn't exist. That's, I mean, it's ridiculous to get that. It's a two-year-old phone that you're going to lock yourself into a two-year contract for because it's free. That is a I think it, it's idea. just, it's there to entice people into the 4 and the 4S. Right, right. If you can upsell from there, fine. There's this old thing in marketing where you always make a sandwich. You have the low-end one that think, people think is crappy and no one buys. And you have the high-end one, which is too expensive and only the premium shoppers buy. And then you have the fat middle version that almost everyone gets because it's reasonable but not excessive. Sounds like my first two wives. <laughs> um, um, all right, so I mean, like, uh, that's about as much Apple stuff as I can take, and I'm the fanboy in the room. <laughs> so I'm going to transition us over to the other, um, I guess, most anticipated hot new phone of the year, Phil. And you were busy leaking something to do with the Nexus. No, oh, oh, hell if I know anymore. So, <laughs> so was it about a week ago we got the invite? We're going to CTIA anyway, right? 
Uh, but we got the invite to Verizon's press conference, and it was a little different than the normal Verizon invites that we're used to seeing. This one, I mean, in addition to just looking different, it has Google's logo on it, and they're going to stream it on YouTube. Now, uh, not Verizon, Samsung, excuse me. So Samsung, I mean, they stream stuff in the past live. Uh, but this one's being streamed on YouTube. So I think it's pretty obvious we're going to get something, some sort of Nexus device, right? Um, and then late last night, early this morning, uh, I guess it's Samsung, put out a teaser video, basically showing the phone, showing the side of the phone. It's got a curved screen. It's got contact charging. Um, there's a lot of debate going on right now whether people think they see a tablet uh, in that little image there. And I just did a little joke video showing dogs with cards behind the picture and that's a joke folks it's a joke wait wait there's there's a poker playing phone (laughs) there's a joke it's a joke it's not real um so we're gonna get something next week now that's something we've talked about before are we just gonna get a nexus phone is there gonna be a new tablet i don't know uh because this is supposed to be ice cream sandwich it's supposed to be the version of android that brings back the phone and tablet OS into one stream. Uh, the Honeycomb OS is not going to be open source. They're not going to release that. So, I mean, this is a big deal. And we'll be there Tuesday, uh, me and Andrew Vaca, you know, when it's released, we'll see. Is it, do people think tablet because it says something big, like maybe a 6.66 inch phone, uh-huh. finally? Yeah, and, and somebody on Google Plus, you know, tweaked the, the levels in Photoshop and now everybody thinks they see a tablet. I don't know. I, I don't necessarily see it. Um, Has there been a Nexus tablet yet? Well, uh, no. There hasn't been a Nexus tablet. The Motorola Zoom was the de facto developer tablet for, you know, three, four, five months. And then uh, I think the Samsung Galaxy S kind of took it over. But no, there's no official Nexus tablet. So I'm not sure if we'll see one. It it would make sense if they announced Ice Cream Sandwich. They're going to show it to us on both form factors, right? Um, But I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily buying it here. I'll put the link in the chat. If you guys want to see it, um, I'm not sure I would want a curved tablet. That just sounds kind of weird. There, see, everybody's thinking it's like the phone would fit into the tablet, and I'm just not like Night Rider. It's going to launch out the back of the truck. Yeah, I mean, uh, Asus has one coming out. I think it's Asus, uh, but uh, I, I just don't think so. I think that's just the rendering and and how things look. And when you mess with the levels enough, you're going to start seeing what you want to see. Could be wrong. But the, we'll see. But the prime code name that doesn't say. Some sort of uh, transformer tablet, something. Nah, well, I mean, we don't know what's called the Prime, right? That's the name that's been out for a long time. Android in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> Androids transform and roll out. I, I'm, I I'm pretty excited. Can, I, I don't I'm think pre- they can do the transform thing without getting in some. Well, I mean, not that Google would be in trouble with Asus, but Asus already has the, the uh, EPAD transformer. And Google has a long history of respecting the copyrights, trademarks, and patents of other companies. So there's no way that's going to happen. <laughs> I'm pretty excited for it because I've been, you know, in the spirit of mobile nations, I've been saying, Phil, one of these days I'm going to get an Android phone just to actually legitimately, you know, use it for a week or two. You got and one. I'm like, this one, or you can have this one. Or you no, no, one. but I said to you, which one should oh, I get? Here we go. We're making the stack again. Wait. <laughs> and you told me to get the Prime. Wait for the Prime. That's what he told me to. Oh, so, Dagwoods. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, wait for the Prime. We'll know in a week. And uh, I've been noticing that uh, Jerry's been tearing up the uh, the editorials on Android Central this week. Like oh I've been God, reading yeah. these articles, uh, like oh my God, one where uh, he thinks he figured out where all the lawsuits came from, and it's that because Apple can't compete in hardware anymore, they have to start firing all these lawsuits to protect iTunes. There's something to be said for that. Well, hold on, but yeah, let me, um, let me uh, while you're on that topic, you know, let me just clarify that Apple makes almost no money off iTunes. They run it at just above break even. It's the opposite model of of uh, Amazon where Apple only provides content because they didn't have any they wanted to sell hardware. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure, you know, I don't think Apple has fallen behind in hardware. I just think that they haven't accelerated again. They're still amazing in battery technology and screen technology and a couple other areas, but they're not, there's no wide gap like there was when the first iPhone came out and everyone else looked down at their trios. Yeah, that. no, and, and these Galaxy S2 phones have so narrowed that gap. Um, I'll be curious to get them up side by side against an iPhone 4S. Uh, but, I mean, the technology leap isn't that great. Where you're going to see the big differences, I think, are in the, the software and the tweaks, and that's yeah. where it's really going to speed things up. I mean, a dual-core A5 versus a dual-core Exynos probably, you know, uh, I think Samsung made them both. Yeah, how about that? 
<laughs> you know, you're going to only have so many millions of operations per second on either one. So it's it might be the same chip. We don't know. It probably is. They probably there's a little sticker on it that you just peel off. <laughs> um. So yeah, we got that. If you didn't hear, we had a giant, a giant, massive security scare this week that I think we all got over in about two days. Yeah, you uh, were late with that. The rest of us. Derek pointed out that the rest of us had been there, done that a year or so ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it, <laughs> it's just the way some permissions are handled, and the way some data is handled on your phone that could potentially allow applications to get you know data the same way. It's you know what, Not Phil? That. Your carrier knows exactly where you are. Yeah, exactly. Oh my so God. My hut. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's much to do it about nothing, but everybody freaked out. So, All right, so let's hand the, um, the, the big phone announcement baton over to Kevin, who actually, you managed to beat Rim to this announcement. Yeah, it's not really a new phone announcement, but, uh, you know, coming up in under two weeks now is their BlackBerry Developer Conference. So I'll be going to San Francisco for that with... Uh, a few members of the crack team and it'll be interesting to see, you know, there's a few expectations. One, we've been waiting for a really big update to the BlackBerry playbook for a while now that we've always kind of dubbed the, the tablet OS version two update. And uh, on the last earnings call, CEO Mike Lazaridis promised we'd see, you know, Qnix phones at, at this show. Now, not necessarily an announcement, like a commercial announcement, but literally developer models. Um, I've written a couple editorials on that saying, you know, what I think it is and that the first Cunix super phones, uh, you know, codenamed the BlackBerry Colt, which is a full touchscreen 4.1 inch display uh, device. You know, they, I think they started to shop that around to carriers. Carriers said, well, we want it to have LTE. Uh, we want it to, um, you know, be a little different looking too. I think it was a pretty industrial designed phone, typical of RIM. And uh, RIM probably said, okay, so they're, they're back to the drag board, you know, working on that LTE Cunix BlackBerry Superphone, but in the meantime, all the prototypes they have lying around, they could probably take to the show now and uh, at least start showing people what what Cunix looks like on a phone, which will basically be a seven-inch tablet just uh, shrunk down. I think it'll probably look identical, just smaller. Do you know this like a rough idea of the size yet? Is it going to be a big phone like Phil? Uh, well, four point one inch. What is what I'm expecting on this one? That's display. a good. Yeah, no, that's that's about a perfect size. If you had to ask me for one, that would be so. It. So the interesting thing that I announced is, uh, you know, BBX or BlackBerry X platform. And, and basically what it is, is right now we have a tablet OS. We have a Cunix based phone, uh, which doesn't really have a name that platform. Going ahead, it's basically the same thing, right? A tablet's just a bigger phone. And I think that's what RIM wants to build too. So they're not juggling two operating systems longer term. So they need a name for this thing because they can't call it the BlackBerry tablet OS. So they're going to rebrand it all the the BlackBerry X or BBX platform, and I think that that'll be sort of the name of the platform, which will likely be the the consumer facing brand also of the operating system. Because you know when these Qnix phones hit, they need, Rim needs to make it very clear to the world that these are not the BlackBerry smartphones you've been using for the last ten years. That this is something totally different, and uh, you know throwing the X in there, I think might accomplish that. I, read I don't the know. Comments on your post, Kevin, and it seems the CrackBerry Nation was more fond of them throwing the Q in there because then it would have been the BBQ operating the, system. Right, but yeah, but we're going to just roast everybody <laughs> with the BBQ. <laughs> Derek, you've been there. You've been through these mm -hmm. platform transitions. Um, they're not yeah. easy. No, no, they're not at all. Uh, we had when we transitioned from Palm OS to Web OS, at first there was no support at all for the older applications, and they came up with Classic which lets you run the old Palm OS applications, but wasn't great. And then after a year, they decided to drop that too, even though there was no technical reason really to drop it. Uh, and it can be rough, but at the same time, if the application and the capabilities are there in the new platform, people don't care that much. And uh, there obviously there are a few apps that will take, a, take longer to develop for a newer platform. Like uh, I think we had to wait a year for Epocrates to do it and then another six months for them to drop it. But even then, it was still, you know, it was, they're very niche apps that you have to wait for what if, so you can actually get them on your new platform. But, you know, if you need that app on, app on the new platform, don't upgrade. If you and Kevin were co-CEOs of RIM, what would you caution them to, to do or not do? You need to learn from some of WebOS's oh. missteps. Mm. I have an article coming on this, so I don't want to divulge it all here. There's a lot of things. If you have do. an article about you and Derek being co-CEOs of RIM, then I'm going <laughs> to... Well, maybe not me and Derek, but I've, I've got a lot of thoughts on it from RIM. I mean, 
But Derek, yeah. I want to hear Derek's. T- Derek's been there. So what's his advice? If if I were in charge of Rim, and going th- going through a platform tr- transition, it, you just have to go full steam ahead. You really, right now they are losing market share and mind share. They might be maintaining themselves with the uh, BlackBerry Seven and the Bold, and maybe the torches. I don't know if anybody's actually buying those. The Problem is they have an they have an image problem. It doesn't have to do anything with this transition. The transition will happen when the transition happens, and if the product is good enough, people will buy it. But the product needs to be good enough, and you need to they they need to stop being uh, what's the word arrogant. I, I don't know. <laughs> I would have gone with Namby Pamby, but I like arrogant too. <laughs> yeah, they they are they're they act like they're. Apple when they haven't had this enormous success that Apple has had recently. BlackBerry's success has been predicated on their existing market share that people want to go to another BlackBerry and the fact that they can push these devices out at low cost on new carriers because they've lo- used low data in developing places like India. They're Apple after Steve Jobs left. Sure. Yeah, that, that actually kind of works. And they need to, obviously they can't go, oh crap, they, they can't come out and say, crap, we're not good anymore. But they, you know, renaming it BlackBerry 7 simply so people don't re- think that they can't update their BlackBerry 6 phones to what used to be 6.1, you know, that's, you can't just solve it all with marketing. I'm impressed, Derek. You, like, know your BlackBerry stuff. <laughs> That's uh, he reads Crackberry. I have to read my boss's work. (laughs) You must. That's awesome. Yeah. No, it's it's, uh, valid points. I can I can look up at Waterloo and I see Palm two years ago, though maybe in slightly better shape. Yeah, more cash flow. When when Rim runs into the wall, it's going to be running into the wall and not just kind of slowly edging its way toward it, like Palm Mm -hmm. and HP did. Like, eh, there's wall over there. We're gonna, you know. Mash ourselves into it here. Just, just gently. Here we go. Oh, the wall hurts. The wall go. hurts. Back up. <laughs> this is going to go head first. One way or yeah. the other. There's going to be a Kevin shaped hole in the wall. First. But, you know, it, I don't know that Rim sees that wall coming. You know, they said that they're going to wait for dual core dual core processors to put out our QNX phones. Dual core processors have been out for six months now. I'm going to have two more cores by the end of the year. <laughs> exactly. Where is the du- oh, yeah. Where is that QNX phone? I'd it's like got to, two weeks. Two weeks. We'll see it in two weeks. Under two weeks. What's interesting, okay, Kevin? We'll is, see. You, just, you, won't be able, you won't be able to buy it for another six months, but you'll see it in two weeks. <laughs> see, and that, that's another problem. That's something that we saw forever with Palm. It took six months to release the original pre. Got one sitting here still. Six months to get this thing out, and then it took them. Three months to get out the pre plus, and six months to get out the pre two, and six months to get out the touchpad, and infinity months <laughs> to get out the pre three. Oh, Derek makes me cry. <laughs> this show just I, got. I'm, I'm here as the <laughs> voice of Christmas past. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's we you know I put up. You can't announce you, you. It yet yes, there is the need to get and in, the investors and the analysts and the public pumped up for your product. But you can't announce something that's going to – it's revolutionary right now when you announce it. You know, when the Pre-3 was announced at a 1.4 gigahertz processor back in February, that was something else. And that was – this was going to be a powerful phone if it had been released in two weeks. It would have might have actually done well. But releasing it now in October, people would be, well, why would I want that when there are 1.5 gigahertz dual core phones coming out next week? It could be like Apple and announce an underwhelming phone and ship it in two weeks. <laughs> yeah, even that would be fine. It would actually, you know, be available. You can't. There, there's. You, you do want to satisfy the investors and the public and everybody, but you can't announce something and then take months to ship it, because then people get excited. That excitement. A phone well, in the hand. Well, there's there's two sto- there's two sides to it. It 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 totally depends if you're announcing an in market device or a new device. So. A good example is what Apple does, right? You know, once an iPhone is selling, uh, they need that announcement time between the existing one and the old one and the availability to date to be as short as possible, right? So you don't overhang your sales. 
Yeah. Um, but if you're announcing something like the first ever, say, BlackBerry Playbook, and you don't have any tablets to cannibalize in your sales channel already, the more time, the better, because you're hoping people will buy apps and develop and maybe hold off buying an iPad waiting for that new BlackBerry. But if there was a Playbook 2, it would be, you know, announced today, ship tomorrow. The problem is bloggers, the problem is bloggers who take that timeline the company would like to stick to and they make it six months to a year. So, mm-hmm. And there's the Osborne you know, effect too because you don't want to announce something that kills your current product line. Right. Yeah. But even then, you know, say the, it dials in consumer expectations. They see the playbook announced seven months ago and it's, it's just sort of, yeah, it's like that, there's a lot of potential there. And they, you know, whenever that comes out, say if it came out in two weeks like this week, okay, that's cool. It's, you know, pretty new and they're still working on it. But then when it takes six, seven, eight months for it to, for a product to come out, people expect in six or seven months, you should have that thing ironed out and perfect. Agreed. Because you've announced it and you said, you know, it's going to take us a couple of months to get this out. So we take the time to get it right. And then it, you know, we had this with HP. This thing took six months to get out with the power of HP behind it. And it's still not perfect. <laughs> I'm not sure HP actually knew they were launching that. I think there might have been some. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we could have discussed Leo Apotecker, but we're just going to forget he ever existed. HP did. So, Kev, what, is, yeah. what, do, you, what do you expect to see at DEF CON? What will it take? Because like, you're the number one BlackBerry fanboy in the world. What will BlackBerry do to make you happy at DEF CON? I'm not, honestly, I'm not sure. I want to see the, uh, the, you know, the next generation tablet OS update, so, which, which should really signify where the phones are at, right? So when we see what v2 software for the playbook looks like that's getting very closer to v1 software for cunix phones at launch uh i expect it to be a lot like the playbook experience shrunk down right so a lot of things we've always dreamed of to be on blackberry phones like front-facing cameras and video chat that'll all be there because the playbook has it so of course the phones will get it the biggest thing is apps we need to see buy-in from app developers um and i feel that's really a challenge right now uh, and then the second thing is ecosystem. So right now I still don't have one good way to buy music and movies and apps all together on my BlackBerry experience, right? I have an app world ID for apps. I can go into the seven digital music store and set up a new account and download some MP3s from there. Uh, I don't have a good way to buy videos on the phone or on a phone or tablet and download them straight to the device. So, you know, if my mom has a playbook. If she's going on a vacation next week, you know, I can't just say, hey, mom, go download a couple of vids to watch on the flight. And that sucks, right? So it's very, um, it's not unified. And, and if they could get that iTunes like, of, you know, even though everybody kind of gripes on iTunes, it is very simple to get core media you need. Uh, I would love to see them fix that. You know, it doesn't necessarily need to be them owning it, but it needs to be them having a unified ID that, you know, ties into whatever services. So it's dead, dead simple to, to buy content on the device. That is an awesome, I'm going to switch things up and use your awesome segue there because, you know, uh, Amazon just took your playbook, um, slapped a fork <laughs> or uh, some sort of derivative of, of, of Android on it and then hooked it up. I, I, you know, I want to call the Android, the Kindle Fire, sorry, the uh, Amazon Kindle Fire a, a tablet, but it's more a giant hose to the Amazon servers. And that's exactly what you're talking about, Kev. They're taking the same hardware RIM used, the same OS Google used, but they're using it almost exclusively to project Amazon content. Yep. I, uh, you know what I'm going to do right now because you've kind of set it up is, so remember a long time ago, I wrote my, uh, you know, that, that Epic smartphone hierarchy of needs post. Yep. Mm-hmm. So what I'm reading, what you're still reading it. There you go. <laughs> DLC. So I've, the RTL. I've been, I've been working on a new theory and I haven't posted yet because I want your advice on it. So we could just have the discussion. Maybe I can finish. I'm going to post the image right there. Uh, Basically, basically, it's called the four C's of tablet success. And, you know, in marketing, there's that there's like the marketing mixed term. It's, you know, the four P's product, price, promotion in place. Anybody who's taken an intro marketing class has kind of learned that terminology. And then more recently, there's a marketing model called, uh, you know, they did the four C's with consumer cost, convenience and communication. And basically, those are the factors which are supposed to you know, dictate whether a product sells or not. But in tablets, it hasn't been the case, right? You know, something like the playbook and the touchpad, for example, got a lot of promotion initially. They had great placement in the stores, but it didn't generate a whole lot of sales, right? It wasn't enough. Uh, So there's some other factors at play that determine how tablets do. 
uh, are going to do. And, and, and I think seeing the Kindle fire get announced last week is really what put me on this because it, it, it sort of showed, okay, what are the most important things here? And I mean, obviously touchpad, Derek, you saw it, right? Touchpads don't yeah. sell, you sell them for 99 bucks and boom. So cost is a huge, huge factor. Uh, so a fire, a Kindle fire at $200 is already very appealing to people. Right. And then content, it's that ease of ease of getting content on the device. So, you know, and clarity, right? What is this device for? So a problem that say the playbook had is I don't think people knew what to do with the thing. Rim called it the first professional grade ta- tablet. I don't think Rim knew, knew what to do. No, exactly. Do. Apple didn't know what to do with the iPad. No, but I, Apple's <laughs> knows what to do with tablets. They'd... But it, but there's this clarity of message where, you know, Apple's the iPad is kind of, I think, positioned as a laptop replacement for some people or a media consumption device. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a laptop for my mom. The Kindle Fire is completely a consumption device, right? It is like killing time on an airplane, which is fine. They don't even have to worry about it, right? And then you have Rim, who positions this product as a professional-grade tablet, is showing need for speed on it, and 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 BlackBerry Bridge and stuff. And it's like, eh, what do I do with it? Yeah. And you know, at a at a hefty price point. So when you look at all those four Cs, you start to see what what dictates tablet success and failure. And I think Android, one of the reasons you haven't seen huge success is because they fall into the same problem with the four C's. The message isn't necessarily clear as to what it's good at. You know, is it a laptop replacement? Is it a media thing? Is it just for geeks? The cost the price hasn't is too high to overcome that. Yeah. The price is too high to overcome that. The content isn't as streamlined, right? You have a bunch of content, but it's not bundled nicely like it is on Amazon or uh, or Apple. And and that's why you you know, despite a lot of great spec tablets, you haven't seen a lot of success in the market for Android tablets. So I don't know if you guys have feedback. One of these days I'm going to write that, but that image says a lot if you look at it. I would like to mm-hmm. point out that only on Mobile Nations can you hear Derek Kessler reset the BlackBerry world and then Kevin Mitchell look tell Amazon how to sell fires. <laughs> there you go. So full of win. <laughs> and I'll shut up now. No. I get so ranty. I get so ranty, guys. I can't help it. I th- think that's. I think that's very true. I mean, it, 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 is, it is absolutely true that Apple really didn't know what to do with the iPad either. You know, Steve Jobs kind of thought there was something there. He's tried his entire career to mainstream computers, uh, but he believed in it. And Apple's kind of groping their way towards what it is. And now they show features rather than specs and they show what you can do with it. But I think, you know, to fill in Derek's point, nobody knows, you know, there is no tablet market yet. We're all just trying to figure it out. And Amazon thinks their web services are their answer to that question. I think so. I pre-ordered one and I didn't even think twice about it. At $200, that's something I will take on the treadmill with me. And if it drops and breaks, I will just not even care. You know, unlike iTunes, because, you know, like we said before, Apple sell, Apple maintains iTunes just above profit to sell hardware. Amazon is selling this at maybe break even, maybe a loss in order to sell content. So they're going to have to be sure that people buy enough stuff to keep that hardware viable on the market. That's the beauty of integrating all those services in the device. You know, with the, you know, that's, it's front and center. You turn on the fire and there is your library of everything that you have going on. It's It's your apps but it's also your movies and your music and everything you're listening to. Whereas with Apple, you know, you want to go get something out of the iTunes store, you go to the little iTunes icon. It's just another app. The Fire ele- Fire and the Fire OS, it elevates your content to the same level as the apps themselves, which is something that other uh, tablet makers have not done. We have newsstand now, Derek. <coughs> whoop de doo <laughs> <laughs> So now, Renee, here's the question for your mom. Yeah. Is it an iPad? Would she prefer or is it a Kindle Fire? If you just think about that ease of, you know, experience for her. See, in a perfect world, I think my mom would be much better suited with a Kindle Fire. The only problem is that Amazon has still not figured out anything close to an international strategy. So right. with an iPad, my mom can get every television show. She has apps for every local network, her local papers. Uh, any content she wants, the Kindle Fire is not going to be available outside the U.S. And Amazon has very few services outside the U.S. So I'm really hoping so, they change that. In the perfect world, your mother would move south. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know if Kindle Fire is enough to to lure her south of the border. The, but the content. The content, yeah. She could watch BBC in, in America instead of in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> and don't forget the cool factor, Renee, too. You know, like Apple didn't know have to know what to do with the, the iPad at the start because they had Apple coolness. 
And they have 150,000 uh, dedicated tablet applications now, which is proving challenging for other people. We've got 1,000 on WebOS. That's like three zeros. <laughs> How many apps do you really need? Like, it's just saying you have a bad web browser. <laughs> well, well, you know, it's, we've, we've had this discussion before. Each user maybe needs a total of 15 or 20 yeah. apps. Nine, 15 of those are going to be the same across 99% of users. It's that long tail of the 5% of apps for the people who need the medical apps, the people who need tire pressure calculators, and all of those that really make the platform. That extra 150,000 apps, and then there are the 20 that everybody needs. And there's choice within categories. I wouldn't say everyone uses the same 15 apps, but they all use the same 15 types of apps. And if you have mm -hmm. five of each to choose from, sometimes it's better than if you have one or two of each to choose from. Um, which is also a good segue because there's rumors that while Amazon is running Android, uh, is it gingerbread, Phil, on the fire? Uh, yeah, it's 2.3, but it really doesn't matter because at that point you're talking framework and not UI or, you know, whatever. There's a rumor yeah. that they might buy WebOS. And if they did, Derek, could we see a WebOS fire? That would be pretty crazy. I, it's We've been in massive limbo in WebOS land. First, we had rumored floated that it was going to be Samsung, and then Samsung said, ha, no. <laughs> and then the rumor was floated that it could be uh, Qualcomm, and Qualcomm said, yeah, we like WebOS. Oh, wait, 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 you're thinking, you're asking for a buy it? No, no, we're not. And See? now it's uh, Amazon, but Amazon and HP have not commented on that, which means absolutely nothing, of course. Yeah. But of those that have been you know, floated, I think Amazon would be an interesting one because it would be allow them to build a, you know, they'd have the f web framework of WebOS, which they're they're a web company. They yeah. do web things, and they make it probably easier to even tie all their services into. But by the same token, they have the Amazon App Store. They have their foothold in Android, and so it's kind of mm, about it. But uh, it's the only. I guess, viable option right now for the WebOS fan base. They could be masters of their own destiny. Exactly. Well, that's what HP was supposed to do, too. <laughs> I never liked HP. Yeah. No, I, I think Amazon might buy RIM because Jeff Bezos loves BlackBerry. You know, apparently the story came out on the weekend there that the original Kindle was inspired by BlackBerry smartphones. And now, and now the new Kindle is inspired by the iPhone. <laughs> no, the, the, yeah, the no, the playbook. The storm. It's, <laughs> the, the Kindle Fire is the playbook. Yeah, How actually, could you say it? It's, I, I thought, you know, who posted that? It was like a Wall Street Journal blog Ryan post Block about actually that. Had that had, he got a scoop on that that said that they were in a rush to get it out, so they went with the playbook chassis. Yeah, yeah I'm but I mean, for, for, that's not a horrible chassis, though. I mean, a year ago, everyone's, you know, including myself, looked at that announcement and said, damn, that's some pretty badass hardware. It's solid kit. Actually. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And Kevin can put it in his pocket. It's true. So Very true. Important. All right, so I'm going to uh, call an end to this this meeting of the Mobile Nations. Uh, what do we call ourselves, Kevin? The Mobile Nations Roundtable. Do we have an official name yet? Summit. The summit. We're, we're summiting. We're summiting all the leaders the of the assembly. free Mobile Nations. The, yeah, the, the General, General assembly. assembly. There we go. Where the General we... Assembly of the leaders of. Yeah. All right. Where can we Done. find out more about you, Kevin? Uh, on crackberry.com, on t the Twitter at crackberry Kevin. I don't quite get how to give my URL on Google Plus yet. Phil, help me. Is there a oh, wait, Google? There's like an unofficial third party link shortener that people are using. So like g.to, there's a gplus.to slash whatever. I don't know. If you can spell my last name, you can probably yeah, find Yeah, just it. search for Kevin Mitchell if you'll find it. I'll never Yay. find him. And uh, that's it. Nice. And you, Phil? I am at Android Central, at Phil Nickinson, Phil Nickinson on Google+. Plus. Um, I'll give you my address. You can come to my house. We'll hang out. Give my phone number. <laughs> I already have it. I'm your friend on Latitude. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. <laughs> oh, gplus.to slash Phil. Yeah. Well, I'm going to get one of those. That's it. Nice. And you, Derek? You can find me on PreCentral, as usual. And you can also find me on Twitter at dkdsgn. Nice. And somewhere on Google Plus, I'm not really sure. So, somewhere on Google Plus? Do you use Google Plus? Uh, in the same way that I use Facebook, and that I have it, but I don't use it. All right. 
Uh, you can find me at Rene Ritchie on Twitter. You can find me at tippy.com. And you can find all of us at Mobile Nations. We are here every two weeks. I'd like to say like clockwork, but we're going to nail that down and make sure that it is like clockwork so that you always get your daily dose of the general assembly um please check out mobilenations.com slash shows for all of our podcasts including the crackberry.com show android central the palmcast iphone live ipad live zenitech iterate super functional i mean there's there are more and more appearing every day i think they're breeding kevin can we talk about the one coming up hopefully at the end of this month or should we keep it a surprise for now tell them you're going to talk about it then we'll stop you and then they'll be all upset at us okay so don't, don't spill don't spill kevin okay sorry it's really going to be good, guys. You're going to want to watch it. Yeah, it's going to be great. Um, Fun. And yeah, that's it. Please go to iTunes. If you haven't already, subscribe to the show. Leave a review. Even if you don't like iTunes, a review helps Apple promote us. And that means more people can find us. And we love talking to you guys. Thank you to everyone in the chat room. You are the best community in mobile. And we heart you. Oh, mobile nation's out. Nice. End of line.